we have to ask ourselves the question, how did we get here? How did we get to this place of uncertainty, to this moment where once again it seems we're at the edge of a precipice? And I'm going to be joined in discussion by three fantastic South Africans, three patriots who really don't need much of an introduction. I'm going to ask, first of all, to have a, a former MP for the ANC, Dr. Makosi Koza, to join us on stage. And then I'm going to ask one of South Africa's best known, possibly most controversial, some might say most respected satirists and cartoonists, Jonathan Shapiro or Zapiro. And then a man who has a stellar record as a public servant, an ANC stalwart, Mr. Mavusom Simang. <laughs> so, our discussion this afternoon is framed, this morning rather, is framed, this is what happens when you're always on the radio in the afternoon, our discussion this morning is framed as how did we get here, and I suppose we don't always have a same, the same sense of what here is, and I'll start with you, Jonathan. Where are we at this moment? When we talk about how did we get here, what place are we describing? What moment are we talking about as a country? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I must say that I'm, apparently I'm replacing Pravin Gordon, which is a very hard thing to do. Uh, <laughs> he will be, he will be <laughs> no doubt, uh, making all kinds of very, very strong interventions. But that's part of, how, of where we are. We're, we're, we're a politician is far more edgy than a cartoonist. I mean, he's one of those people, and I'm also sitting with some other people here who are luckily uh, people that we can put some faith in, and it, it's, it is absolutely appalling that the mainstream of the ANC, the, the mainstream of government, is, is captured, is, uh, has let us down so badly. Um, it, you know, when, when I think of some of the moments leading up to Polokwane, uh, not only moments, I'm talking about years. Uh, sometimes people ask me, when is the first critical cartoon you did of Jacob Zuma? Um, I've also posed the question to other people. And people say, oh, maybe 2006, 2005. End of 2002, he's had a corruption cloud hanging over him since the end of 2002, and it began earlier. That's when the public got to know about it, if you were watching. So how the ANC then put their faith in the wrong person, knowing that perhaps it was time to get rid of uh, Thabo and Becky in, in some way, uh, not in the way that it happened, how on earth did the ANC go so wrong? If you look at the kind of coalition that got behind Jacob Zuma, um, everybody's gone off in different Zuelan Zimavavi and Julius Malema and, and uh, uh, it, if, if, everybody, I mean, from all the different factions that supported him, they've all gone in different directions. They're all saying we were, we were wrong. Um, it, it's really, really difficult for somebody who's not inside the ANC to understand how good people could have screwed up so badly for so long. Is it purely about the ANC? I mean, can we say that we're all just, you know, observers of what's unfolding, of what's been unfolding in the time frame that you've given? Because if that is the case you're making, one has to ask, why has this opportunity, this ongoing series of on goals not created a space in which other people, other voices can be heard, other alternatives can be considered? Well, well, one of the fantastic things about South Africa is, I mean, it, when I travel around the world and I meet uh, cartoonists from other places, I meet editors from other places, I, I, I see what's happening in media and other places. People say to me, you publish that 
at, the, in, at, at a crucial time in your country, we have had incredible freedom. So how does that, how does that work? I know that there's issues around things like SABC, uh, there's issues, you know, there's the constant capturing and uncapturing and recapturing and whatever. And there are, so some of the electronic media, especially SABC, really, really battle with that. But if the, the space that we've had as media to, to be free, to say what we want to say, to, to the columnists, cartoonists, um, editors, to actually be out there if you want to and do what you want to do. And, civil, and civil society, amazing, amazing things. Massive effects from things like the Treatment Action Campaign and all the organizations that spun off them. So it, it, it's hard to understand what more civil society, organizations, media, other voices could have, could have done and said. Dr. Koza, I suppose if we talk about outsiders, you know, people looking at the ANC, we tend to make it just about the party. And I suppose for people in the ANC, people like yourselves, quite often the narrative is just about the individual, the persona of President Jacob Zuma. But as Jonathan points out, a lot of these problems have been with the party for a very, very long time time. It's not just about the individual. Um, I really do believe, and having been within the ANC for the last 35 years, I can tell you that it boils down to the uh, leadership moral crisis within the ANC. But again, I also think that it's the failure of the ANC to transition from the underground uh, liberation movement culture to a culture of um, accountability in a democratic constitutional dispensation. And again, I think the, the, the leadership of the ANC as a collective, and I wouldn't like to apportion blame only to President Jacob Zuma, because I feel strongly that all of them are equally to be blamed for lacking courage or for allowing the rot to sink in and for the politics of patronage to take hold of the organization. Dr. Koza, is there any sense of reflection on your part as a recently senior member of the party to say you were a part of it? You stood by, you watched this culture that you are now describing and at the very least looked away or didn't say, at least not, not early on. Unfortunately, South Africans got to know me better when I became a member of parliament in 2014. Prior to that, I was actually in the provincial legislature. And if you Google some of the things that happened to me whilst I was in KZN, as I was trying to raise the dangers of complacency and the dangers of denying that South Africa is actually on a downward uh, trajectory. I was actually, uh, I had my land invaded, I was persecuted in KZN. At some stage I had to leave uh, the position of the chairperson of SCOPA, Standing Committee on Public Accounts, and I went back to, to the private sector because I couldn't take it anymore. But the branches of the ANC begged with me to is why I ended up in 2014, and unfortunately, South Africans only got to know me when I became uh, an MP sure, nationally. You, you, sure, you and I have had this conversation before in terms of your history, particularly in KZN, but when you came to Parliament in 2014, when you are now on the national stage, and as a member, as a part of that collective, mm. as you watched decisions being made, as you watched people defending really the indefensible what were you thinking? What were you saying? You know, you have to understand democratic centralism. What is it about? And also, you also have to understand that within the ANC, there is a culture of um, collective responsibility. Whether for, for good or for bad, there is that culture. Within the caucus, you will have to, we raise the issues, but once the majority say, we have to defend Inganta for a, as a good example, when you go there into the chamber, you cannot deviate from the collective decision, so-called collective decision. Was there any debate though? I mean, in, in, in terms of what was being discussed in the caucus, what, what were some of the things, was there any pushback around 
that this was utterly, utterly indefensible. By the way, I must tell you something. There are MPs that became very, very unpopular. And one of those MPs is Montli Kungubele, Pravin Kotan, uh, Derry Kanekom, those type of MPs, including myself, because in the caucus, we were raising those issues. But unfortunately, as it had happened on the 8th of August, we were outnumbered. And uh, although I still appreciate the fact that they had expected that it was just going to be the four of us that were going to vote against uh, the president, but it turned out that uh, we actually had about 35 members that actually decided to take a stand. Mr. Msimang, as part of the stalwarts, you've just had, you know, your, 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 your consultative uh, con conference this past weekend. Over and over and over again, repeatedly, the party has dismissed your grouping. They have said, for example, this past weekend that this was not a gathering they sanctioned. For all the moral outcry you have been a part of, this current leadership swats you like flies. To them, you don't count. At a personal level, having given so much to this organization, it surely must hurt. I'm glad I'm in this gathering which has not been sanctioned by them today. <laughs> um, it's, 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 I just want to take a few points back, Samo, uh, and refer to how we came here, respond to that. I think we did not take the trouble to understand power and therefore devise ways of managing it. Uh, had we done so, we would have come up, among other things, with a code of ethics, thou shalt not, thou shalt not that, and not leave it to the judgment of the individual and say, this is a good comrade, he won't do A, B, C, D. There must be a safeguard. You shouldn't do it. That's with, with respect, I want to come in there. I mean, if you look at just even some of the documents that came out of the policy conference as recently as July, in terms of how the party says it wants to approach the kind of comrades and cadres it deploys, in terms of being associated with people who are under a cloud of corruption. It's almost comical when you look at the high aspirations they have on paper versus what we're seeing in reality. So how would that have helped? Because even now, they're claiming to be doing those things. Uh, the, the, the claim is hollow but we should have come up with an enforceable code of principle. But I'll, I'll come to talk about one of the reasons why we are where we are. We are here because the manner in which the system in which ANC elects its leaders is so faulty that if in fact this country were to conduct its uh, elections like that, we would really be in serious trouble. It allows for factions, it allows for things that are called slates. You have more money, you've got more influence, you get anything that will support that. It's an ancient system which worked when power was not a factor, when the important thing was to get the good people to go and fight for the good cause. That ought to have been changed and part of what the uh, conference uh, on the weekend was doing was to say let's completely overhaul the system uh, of electing our leaders right from branch level to the very top because it has produced this set of people who really should never have been there. We are in a crisis because a lot of the people who went in through slaves, I can tell you about people who will have been found to have committed criminal acts in Gauteng, there is one person, big, and was sacked by the Gauteng government. He found himself in a slate that was Zuma's, and he's laughing and looking down at Gauteng from the NEC. Now, that should, that's one example where we would have said, if you have been found guilty of ABC, you may never be such and such a thing. You know, that's just but one of the examples. But another thing was, it was going to be very important to, it was very important to define conflict of interest. You know, when the black economic empowerment strategy was devised, I thought it was a good thing. This country would not have been very manageable 
if you had a swath of poor black people and uh, a top cream of, uh, of white people, because that, that's what apartheid was about. But the BEE strategy was so mismanaged. In fact, it, it never took off. Now, if people had defined that you may not be a policymaker, such as the people who sit on the NEC of the ANC, and also go around and be a beneficiary of, of this the system. You, they, unfortunately, business is short-sighted. It looked for important people. Uh, I can mention names here. I don't know. There are Feel some free. Of, yeah, yeah. It, it got the, the Cyrils, the, name them. All these people are extremely rich now, richer than people who have been uh, at business for as long as they have lived. Business gave them the opportunity to get huge shareholdings because they were hoping to benefit by associating with a leadership. So that's that. PE should have given people an opportunity to provide input to, into the business. So let's talk about what here and now is and what it means. For the three of you, what are the three most critical challenges facing South Africa that if we don't address with the requisite seriousness, we will be, excuse my French, in even bigger shit. Jonathan. I mean, that's, that's an almost impossible thing to, to, to come up with three, well, let, let me try, give it a shot. I mean, the first thing is to actually find a way to take the state capture, seriously dissect it. Um, I mean, I was watching those hearings yesterday, and I was watching Pravin Gordon and others um, asking incisive questions of Lynn Brown and, uh, and, and others. And it, it, the quicker those things that are happening in Parliament, Parliament is regaining a sense that it really does feel as if those parliamentary committees are at last regaining a sense of self, a sense of, of, of being able to do the right thing. But that must go way beyond that. It's, it's all the different facets of actually, um, I mean, a proper inquiry, not Jacob Zuma's token toy inquiry, which, you know, another captured inquiry, but a serious thing, which actually dissects everything and makes people accountable. I, I mean, that, that, that is, it's, all, it's a pipe dream at the moment, because in every respect, they, they, there's, there's pushback, there's abuse of the legal system, and the legal system has already got captured people in it as well, and the Sean Abramses and the, the whoever, you know, whoever's yep. currently in the Hawks. But that's the, that's the first thing. But somehow or other, I mean, just to, off the top of my head, a sense of shame, a sense of shame, somehow the people who have been sitting too quietly need to somehow work on, the, on the, 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 there's a large area, I mean, we always hear about it, I mean, we, we've just heard, heard about it from, from, from both of you in a sense, that, that there are people who actually do feel ashamed, do feel like they, they're, they're bread and butter, they're, their jobs are on the line, uh, but they've got to actually take some action, they've got to actually uh, feel that sense of in, uh, shame and impose it on the people above them, so that's another thing. Um, I, I would, uh, a third, let's say a third thing, um, I, I don't, I, you know, I just can't, I can't understand how uh, people like Lindiwe Sisulu, Zweli Mkize, and okay, I can probably understand a lot better why Nkosa Sana Lamini Zuma did, uh, said they would be here at the gathering and then pulled out. I mean, they, what, what, they, what, what that indicates to me is playing to audiences that are not here. They're not interested. They are interested in their constituencies, in how they can engineer and maneuver towards this, this 2017, end of 2017, and, and then 2019. And that's politics. Yes, but what I'm saying is how can they, I, I, I understand Kosazana Lemini Zuma, you know, say on the one end of that, of that spectrum, and Zweli Keys is somewhere straddling and Lindiwe Sisulu, I thought she would be here. Uh, it, it's, a, it's unbelievably cowardly to just pull out. So un, until some of those people start taking seriously, not only their, the, the way that they're maneuvering the ANC, but also this vast 
group of people outside, urban people, um, people, people watching, people in media, people in organizations, people around the world, they, they just appear to be okay. not interested. And until there is some kind of co like bridge there, I don't see we're going to break this. So deal with state capture, convert some of the shame into action, and maybe be accountable to all South Africans, not yeah. just those who agree with you. What are the three critical challenges you think, if we do not deal with, we will be in more shit? You know, I, I honestly think that we need to um, stretch our imagination back to 1995, when the Springbok won the, the World Cup. And, um, and stretch our imagination back to 1996 when we won the African Nations Cup. And I do think that we definitely have to unite as South Africans. And that must be punctuated by moral, visionary, and moral and ethical leadership. Because without those critical factors, there is no way we can grow our economy. And we are technically on the cliff right now. And if we are not doing anything about this, this economy is gonna collapse. What do you say to people who say, but even those moments were not moments of real unity, they were plasters on a gaping wound? You know, to be honest with you, I honestly disagree with those people. That's how you build a nation. It's got to start somewhere. Even those moments, a good leader will leverage on those moments and actually build on them. What had actually happened is that the new leadership that came in forgot about those moments, for discounted or, or, or took out or subtracted unity from the equation. And to me, you can't subtract unity from the equation of building a strong economy. To me, it's extremely important that we find each other. And we also need to move away from apartheid social constructs. This thing of calling each other whites, blacks, this and that. I honestly think that maybe we should be considering calling each other South Africans of European origin or maybe South Africans of Indian origin or whatever. Something like that, that is prefixed by our understanding that we are in the first instance South Africans before our, our origins matter. Unity? Yes. What are the other and two? And secondly, I think we have different kinds of injustices in this country. With our interest, the kinds of injustices, corruption is not a crimeless, is not a victimless crime. Corruption is, has victims, and we are victims of that. But the, the people that are really affected by corruption are the social grants recipients who have their, their, their social grants deducted unlawfully, but they have no, there is no recourse. And some of them, they don't get paid their social grants for three months, and, uh, when they, uh, and nobody explains why. And when it comes back, it's only for one month. The, the other two months, we don't know what that money went to. And so I am saying corruption is not a victimless crime. It is a crime of everyone, whether you're rich, you're poor, or whatever, you are a victim of corruption. And corruption is at the center of the disinvestments in the country. Nobody can put their money in a country where they know that whatever taxes that they are paying are not going towards the good cause, are not going towards addressing our social responsibility. Because whether we like it or not, we have a responsibility over the majority of poor people in South Africa. And finally, I want to say to you, to me, there is no way you can restore dignity to somebody who is unemployed. There is no dignity in unemployment. You need to have a job. And that is why it is very important for us to create a, a conducive environment for economic growth, create conducive environment for job creation, create conducive environment for investors to feel that their money is safe in South Africa. So let us unite, let's yes. deal with corruption, Injustices. and let's create employment. Yes. Mr. Msimang, your, your, your three critical things we need to deal with. Well, politicians have really let the nation down. That's a fact. That's why we are where we are. So the trust that was given to political parties, but I suppose in particular now, the party that won government and ran government, 
uh, uh, those uh, trust, that confidence has been seriously misplaced. It's time, you know, the other day, Professor Njabulon Debele gave a keynote address at the um, National Consultative Conference of the Veterans of Older People Like Me. And he said, there must now be a second revolution. The trust that was given to politicians has been messed up. Maybe people should move forward. Civil society must come forward and be a lot more active than it is and defer less to politicians than it is currently doing. I echo that view. If you see what's happened in Brazil, in, um, I think in Turkey and other places, it is the civil movement of the people that has brought down corrupt leaders and actually brought down governments. I think, um, I don't know what's going to happen in December with the elective conference there, but it's an election that's being fought on really very faulty ground in the first instance. Whoever emerges there is a person who will have resources, whether they come from the Guptas or they come from other uh, parts of the, an ordinary ANC person mobilizing within the party uh, and using lots of money to get people bust to places, uh, giving other little favors here and there, is, 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 is not a corruption for a democratic uh, organization. So my fear is that past uh, December, if uh, somebody wins, it will be status quo continued. Um, I think we all know who is somebody who would not change the status quo. Uh, if uh, Cyril wins, I don't know whether he will be under the stress of the economy and the need to build unity, go to, go to bed with the very thieves that he would have defeated, that will be an abandonment of South Africa. South Africa will need a person who will say, the past so many years, 10 more, have really been a waste. I will forge unity with people in civil society. We must find a new way of organizing uh, in such a way that the people now will uh, take a more active role in politics. That's, I think. All right, I will not hog the conversation. I do want to take a couple of questions from the floor before we run out of time. If uh, anyone has questions for our panelists, please can I have a hand? And I think we do have roving mics around the room. We have a question right here in front, please. Could we pass a mic towards uh, the lady in the front here? Sorry, I picked the lady in the front. Please give her the mic. Sanbonani. My name is Sipati Tolo from the group called Holikade Group. We are a group of ex-owner drivers from SAB Miller and ABI Coca-Cola who've been exploited. So I like what Mr. Msimanga was saying about the PEE, even about our political parties. Really, everyone turned their back on us. No one is listening to us. Coca-Cola and, and SAB Miller, they're exploiting people. People are dying, people are homeless. They're uh, terminating their contract unlawfully because they've got money, because- I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. They're not here to speak for themselves. Could I please ask you to direct your question to the panelists? So what, uh, oh, I can even, okay, I, I still support Mr. Msimang that our political parties are not doing anything. So what we need to do, we as the, uh, the, the community, we need to fight on the ground. We need to stand up and unite and fight because now we relied on people who don't care about us anymore. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We'll take another comment, the gentleman at the front. Hi there, good morning. My name is Mark Gilbert. Uh, fairly simple question for the panel. Uh, my deep concern is that the ANC seems to have an underlying socialist uh, agenda. Uh, and we've seen in places like Venezuela uh, and others, this inevitably ends up uh, in a very, very dark and bad place. 
uh, I agree that true empowerment and true liberty and freedom comes from employment, and we've seen the capitalist model around the world work. Okay, and we'll take maybe one or two more from this side of the room, and then I'll let the panelists respond to those questions. We have a hand over here. Um, morning, my name is Lisa Hontahai. I just have a very simple question. When you guys were negotiating the constitution or the electoral system, why did you prefer to go for a party-less system versus something that has more direct representation? Because I feel that kind of enforces some kind of accountability with people who elect to parliament in power. All right, we'll take one more maybe from the back over there. Uh, the gentleman in the green shirt and maybe the lady in the black and then we'll let the panelists respond. Hi, thank you, my name is Ian von Memerty. Uh, my questions are specifically to Mr. Hinsamang and Dr. Koza. First of all, thank you for speaking with such dignity and uh, giving us a sense of hope. As part of that 15% of the ANC caucus that did not vote for Jacob Zuma, you most probably represent 15% of the current ANC voters. What is your advice to them that disenfranchised and disenchanted ANC voter who does not know where to turn in 2019 and what is the way forward for him and what do you propose to do as that leadership in terms of offering them an alternative if, as you say, the ANC elective conference does not come out with a new form of operating? Right, we'll take one more. I think the gentleman in the black, sh lady in the black shirt, beg your pardon. Hello, my name's Heather Malcolm, it's from ZWBDC. I want to know from Mr. Mazang how they propose to change the political election system. All right, those are the questions. Uh, feel free to respond to the ones directed at you and in general. We'll start with you, Jonathan. Yeah, can I take a sort of a left field approach, so to speak, just to uh, respond to the gentleman over here who said the ANC displays a... a, a He's worried about the ANC displaying a socialist agenda. Um, if, he, if the ANC is displaying a socialist agenda, it's not doing it very clearly. Um, I, I don't see the socialist agenda at all. I would love to see something more of a socialist agenda. <laughs> that a state, state capture is not socialism. The, the, the manipulation of, of BEE to empower a tiny elite over and over and over is not a socialist agenda. Uh, the way that things are being done and, 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 and screwed up uh, top down, um, and I know that there have been many socialist movements that have become communist movements or where things have not been um, as bottom up as they should be. But, but true socialism, which is actually for the benefit of people, uh, it has the, the aspects of that that have been tried, that have worked, and that should infuse our system um, okay. and, and, and be more, much more caring than an out-and-out out capitalist system. Um, I wish that would, would happen. That's what we need. All right. Uh, yeah. Dr. Koza? Well, I, I honestly do think that um, we have to accept that South Africa is a small open economy operating within a capitalist um, economic system. And I do feel that we have not done enough to master the way the capitalist economy works. And over and above that, though, we have to be mindful of the fact that we are coming from a racial capitalist uh, model that was hugely exploitative, and it continues to be so. Probably we need to also reconfigure the new capitalist model for South Africa that is punctuated by Ubuntu, which is based on interconnectedness, interdependency, interrelatedness, and compassion. And if we do that, probably we may as well offer the world an alternative form of capitalism. And again, I do think that we have failed to acknowledge that this age that we are in is extremely disruptive. And there is no way there is nowhere in the world where a communist country was rescued by a communist country. It is always rescued by a capitalist country. And the logic says to me, we need to start mastering this economy. But um, having said that, I think it's going to be important for me 
to declare to you that I honestly don't think that the ANC December elective conference is going to deliver the results that we need as South Africa. I really think that we need as South Africans to find a new political model that is going to take into account civil society and I can tell you now that we are working on that. I'm not at liberty to disclose this to you right now, but we are definitely going for change because whether we like it or not, change is inevitable. We've got to shift. Every one of us has to shift from our traditional perspectives of looking at things, and we have to make sure that we are visionary, moral, ethical, courageous, and leaders that are committed to this country, to building this country. That would be my submission. Thank you. So a new, so a new political party. It's a measure of, of different, you, you know, one of the things that people don't understand, the ANC has been, um, we've had a number of people that have been getting out of the ANC over years. All those people have been establishing their own uh, political parties, especially at local government level. So these people came to approach me and they said, Makosi, would you like to actually assist us in leading the measure of all, these, uh, of all these formations so that we can create a new political home that is going to be at the center? And when I say at the center, I am saying this because we have a responsibility on your extreme right. You have a responsibility to grow the economy and master the capitalist system. But on this other left, you have a responsibility to ensure that the majority of South Africans who are trapped in poverty are actually get out of that system because the social grant system as is right now, the over 18 million social grant recipients is not sustainable. We need to invest in education. As you know, the World um, Economic Forum recent report, 2016, 2017 report, put South Africa at number 138 out of 138 in mathematics and science. Which country in the world ever prospered when it is actually number last in the world in mathematics and science. I think we need to fix the quality of our education system. Okay. We are already spending way too much on that education system, but do we have the results to show? We don't, and that's my view. Mr. Msimang, there were, there were a couple of questions. <laughs> Capitalist exploitation, the electoral system, maybe you want to deal with those two? Very quickly, I always speak about the ANC in the inclusive. I never was and do not intend to be a politician. It's, uh, I would be enjoying time with my grandchildren now, if not for Jacob Zuma, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so, I wouldn't be an expert on the electoral system, but I think at the time in 1994, the National Party actually was more inclined, was more in favor of a federal the kind of system that we have. There was a fear, we were white people and blacks and so on, and the, if it was just a plain majority rule, an overwhelming number of black people would have voted for a black party, which was mainly the ANC. And I think in the wisdom of Mandela and other people, they said, let's try this. But then, um, who is the gentleman uh, who has since proposed that we switch away from the list, from the proportional, Fansal Slabet. He's produced a really good report that suggests the way forward for South Africans. And I think the Fans uh, uh, recommendations really do need very serious consideration. Allow me though also to say, you know some extremely progressive South Africans, I call them South Africans, yes. they happen to be white. Mm. And <laughs> And, and, and you know, one of these guys says, you know, develops a paper that is incredible in its progressiveness. He says, oh, but sometimes we white people must stay at the back because how do you concede that? And I've, I, these are South Africans. Americans, by the way, the American nation is 
predominantly occupied by white people who went from Europe. No one ever says other groups. They are Americans. So I agree with you that you are talking about South Africans here. If it's important to somebody to say I'm of Indian origin or vendor origin, that's fine. That's uh, their business. But people are retreating, and you must not really allow people to define you by race. I know it's not easy, but just don't make that concession. And this is where I see sometimes, and this is so alien to ANC politics, absolutely alien. Uh, but don't retreat. My point is, we must find a formula for civil society to step forward and take more of the rights that has been surrendered to politicians. Well, unfortunately, that brings us, ladies and gentlemen, to the end of our panel. I think a round of applause for our panelists. The initiative for this potential something else outside of the ANC didn't come from the flaky commentator sitting on the sideline. It came from people at the, who've been in the heart of the ANC. That coalition that could happen, that could happen, could start happening now from a fracturing and a bringing together of civil society and the best that's still in the ANC and people from other parties. That is an, it's fantastic. Both of you have said it. I think it's such an important thing to have come out of this. Because, because you're my elder, I will allow you a quick, quick, quick closing no, comment, and then we have to wrap it up. Somebody <laughs> asked what's to be done about the people who are sitting on the NEC and places like that. Those are heroes who are fighting against the system. They're fighting against, They're really a few God, uh, good people. They are a minority. Some have come out like this one here. Uh, <laughs> and, and others have been expelled. But you still do have, and I think it's good to work within the system and change it from inside. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. <laughs>